Today, we will be comparing a Lightphone 2 with an iPhone 5S with a view of determining which of them is a better distraction-free phone. Given that the iPhone 5S was not designed to be this, a bit of messing around is required to give it the features it needs. If you jump to this time, I will explain how it is done. The Lightphone 2 was a Kickstarter project aimed at providing a distraction-free phone for people who felt themselves overwhelmed with notifications and distractions from their smartphone. I love the idea of it, and I love the e-ink display on it. I think it is such a great screen material because no matter what environment you're in, it does look good. Um, it has some downsides in that like the, uh, the refresh rate is a little slow, and sometimes you're not sure if your input is registered or not because of the reaction time. But all in all, it should be an acceptable phone screen. And uh, some Hisense phones actually are smartphones that use this. The iPhone 5S is a typical smartphone of its time, though perhaps smaller, which is part of what makes it great for this purpose. If we take a look at them, they are roughly the same width. The iPhone 5S is about 25 to 30% taller. Um, if you put them on their sides, you can see that the iPhone is thinner, which is convenient. And um, you can see also that one is built of plastic. And with a matte screen. And the other is a aluminum unibody chassis glass screen with reflective and fingerprint magnet. <laughs> the light phone weighs 77 grams versus the 111 grams of the iPhone. The iPhone is noticeably heavier, but neither of them are very heavy, especially con compared with modern smartphones. Both devices feel excellent, um, though I may prefer the Light Phone's soft feel, like out of case, with the iPhone's rather more uh, angular and sharp feel. However, um, I think the iPhone gives you a better grip to prevent from dropping it. As far as actually using the device, um, the lock button's on the top, you press that, then there's a menu button on the side which you press. That gives you access to this menu here. Now I'd like to phone someone, it gives me a list of my contacts, and the phone is actually a unified um, text message and phone calling program, kind of. Like, they treat the phone like what would formerly be like a dumb phone as a separate app. So if I click my wife here, I can phone her or I can write her a text message from it. The iPhone has a fairly standard for a smartphone calling feature. Uh, you have your favorites, recents, contacts, keypad, and your voicemail. Visual voicemail is actually a sweet feature that the light phone doesn't have. Um, as far as calling from locked, Hi. Hello. To send a message, you go back to that previous menu we were at, and you press the pencil. Um, it is not the easiest, <laughs> and typos do happen. So I sent her that. There we go. See, um, now let's see if she sends one back. Okay. 
There we go. If I press this, it should just send me to it. There we go. She says, I can't text you back. And unfortunately, it gets worse from there. Emoji, you can't actually send. But you can receive them, they just show up weird. And an image shows up like that. Um, the Lightphone service, I believe, allows you to get messages on your browser, but that's not available if you're not in the United States. Again, like, you'll be familiar with this. Um, it's just a list of your most recent contacts. You want to write a new one to one of your contacts who you're not sure. Their phone number, you can go to that. Um, anyway, as your recent menu though, as well as like, you can scroll back a good ways and you can see pictures, which the other one can't. Uh, emoji are very easy to get and send. There we go. Very easy to access when you got it. Autocorrect is less good than Android's, but it's pretty good, especially compared to the light phone. Yeah, sending a picture message is easy, though a bit slow on a phone this age. The alarm is similarly bare bones. You type in a time, there you go, it's set, and you can unlock it. You can see a little notification up there telling you have an alarm set, similar to the iPhone. Um, you have to set it each day, and there's no recurring alarms or week scheduling like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday kind of alarm versus your Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So that is a little frustrating, having to set this each night. Now, the clock app is much more full featured. You have your world clocks, your alarms. Um, I can set recurring ones. Um, I can set bedtime, which is awesome. I really like this one. It calculates eight hours for you. Oh, there's another message. Um, it calculates eight hours for you and um, sets your bedtime, which, I mean, you can do in your head, but it's nice. All right. So anyway, setting alarm, you add there, gives you a little picker. Um, 21, there you go. Easy as that to get rid of them, like that. Um, I, shut them on and off. You know iPhones, they're very convenient. Now let's take a look at the calculator. Um, it doesn't do square roots, which is frustrating. Uh, it's The typing is a little rough at times. You're not necessarily sure if you've gotten it. And the feedback sometimes misses, which is frustrating. It also doesn't have one over X functionality, which is really handy if you don't have an answer, like previous answer button on your calculator. The calculator app is superior on the iPhone, even though this one is exactly the same. Um, I think it is faster also does order of operations like five minus five times six. If you don't have what you need on the long screen, you can flip it over and get your scientific mode. You get your square roots, um, or other kinds of roots, and trigonometry, inverting, 
which is really handy whenever you need to uh, divide by your answer because neither of them have the answer button, which is very frustrating. Next is the podcast app. This as well is pretty bare bones. You can see here you have all your most recent uh, podcasts, which you can scroll through. It shows four at a time, and scrolling is a little slow. So if something is back there on your podcast, it may be hard to get to. Uh, you can also go by show and you can see from inside that menu the latest episodes of that. If you want to add a new podcast, you have to go to the Lightphone website and enter it in there. In it, poet Aaron Alonig and I explore the human condition by conducting a close reading. Simone Ve, Mamon Ve, The Needs of the Soul, written around 1943, and Meditation on Obedience and Liberty from 1937. So this whole thing is, it's really hard. Everyone is West, therefore they can't really have those obligations. And it's politically, a lot of pernicious things follow from the idea that groups can have obligations. Like individuals, for instance, can inherit the crimes of the group or the past crimes of the members of the group. And it's bound up with nationalist... The light phone does support Bluetooth, um, though it doesn't support skipping forwards and back with my particular earbuds, though the iPhone does. I have these MPOW M30s true wireless earbuds for what it's worth. Podcasts are another one where your iPhone is much superior. Like, I mean, this is overcast. It's not actually, uh, not actually the default app, but I like it and you can have it on iPhone. So I think it's fair to compare. Uh, this is basically the same menu, my downloaded menu. Um, you can add and remove podcasts from the actual app itself, which is really helpful. Spinoff podcast subtext. In it, poet Aaron Alonig and I explore the human condition by conducting a close reading time. For a while, new ep- You'll also find us at subtextpodcast.com. As you can see, the iPhone is considerably louder as well through the headphone. Let's check out settings. It's a pretty simple menu, much more simple and hierarchical than the iPhone. It's only one page. Um, Airplane mode, it's pretty easy to get into. And then there's your notifications um, menu. It just has some ringtones you can select. You can't do custom ringtones on this. Um, and you cannot actually select which people you want to hear from, unlike the iPhone. There's very actual little control of the notifications, which is one disadvantage. A severe disadvantage this phone has in its actual job of being distraction free. Um, now inside preferences you have some more options, passcode, you can set passcode which I did not because it's extremely tedious to use. You can set just like timeouts color inversions, signal, etc. Either way, it's, it's not a very full-featured um, settings menu, but that's fine for what it is. Uh, it's a little bit annoying to move in and out of, but then so is the iPhones. Now what we really need to talk about is the missing apps on here. There's no navigation and no music, neither of which I would consider um, distractions, though I would consider beneficial to have in a phone. Music more so than maps, because you can just get a paper map, but it is handy having navigation in your phone. There is actually a Spotify app for iPhone, so it's there. It's very slow on the iPhone 5S, but it works. You can... One day, 
to get music fast enough. Um, the lock screen menu is superior for both podcasts and music. Obviously, navigation, you have that. So now we are at the part of this where I show you how to get the iPhone locked down like this. So inside your screen time settings, oops, you can set, go to this tab here, content and privacy restrictions. So you set yourself a password in here and disable downloading apps and disable um, Safari. Then you can go through and delete whatever social media apps, um, Facebook messages, etc., and um, basically strip down the functionality to just those things that you do not find distracting. I don't have any ability to get on the internet here. I don't have any ability to download apps. Now, the hitch is someone has to know the password. Um, I have kept the password myself in the past. I found that didn't work. I have given to other people. I found that didn't work because I eventually I would just ask them. I mean, sometimes shamefully, but I would ask them for it and I would install like um, a Reddit client or Facebook or whatever. But depersonalizing it with this app called Time Caps, um, in it, you can put information in to seal away from yourself for an amount of time. So I put the password from the content restrictions in there and then did my best to forget it and I was successful. Um, then you set how long in the future you want it to open and then you figure out what apps are working, which ones aren't, which ones are distracting you, which ones you thing you want that won't distract you, you make those adjustments when your time capsule opens, and then you set a new password, put in a new time capsule, and then set it for a longer time. You can, of course, reset your phone to get around this, um, but I think it's enough of a barrier that I haven't anyway. Yeah, unfortunately, it is a free app, but you have to buy credits and the time capsules. So you, these are the credits you buy, and it's like... It's a buck thirty nine for for three time capsules, which should be enough to get you going, because you can uh, do your first test of a day long, try a few weeks, and then try like a year, which is what my next one is. I've already done a few weeks. Now I'm gonna try a year once I make the adjustments I want, like adding Google Maps. So um, I don't believe you can actually reset it without. Um, so if I go here, reset, reset all settings, I have to enter my restriction passcode, which means I've locked myself from restarting the phone. So as long as the time capsule is shut, I can't get in. And that takes the decision out of my hands, which allows me to ignore my phone. And I'm not even going to cover in any depth all the other features you can have. You can have a chess app or um, Siri, which is helpful when you're in the car or you need to dictate a long text message. Even on a phone this old, she's still pretty accurate. You can get weather. You can get, um, is honestly, a way better battery life. Like, at my work... Um, the light phone dies in three hours from bad reception. This lasts all day. And like with the browser and Facebook all off of this, you can get two days of usage if you have good cell reception at your house. Um, privacy is better because you don't need a passcode. You can use your fingerprint sensor, like which is a lot faster than like... I didn't even ever lock my light phone because entering a passcode, I just couldn't be bothered. But with this, the fingerprint is fast, even though it's first gen touch ID, it's totally adequate. Um, you have reminders, you have notes, health, FaceTime, all this stuff. 
that is not necessarily distracting, but is super enriching. And you can have it without any downside. And it's cheaper. I'll insert some pictures from eBay of the prices you these are fetching. Like, you can get them for like a hundred bucks or so. Whereas a light phone, it's going to be at least a few hundred. Um, a Canadian, sorry. Um, so like a couple hundred American. $90, $80, plus shipping. And then we can take an even better phone, iPhone SE. Look for it. Look at that. 64 gigabytes, 128 gigabytes, unlock, and 110 bucks plus free shipping. It's a phenomenal deal. Like, it also, like the touch screen is much more responsive. Now, I love how e-ink looks to my eyes, but like this is just responsive. Uh, it's pretty shocking considering this is an eight year old phone now. It's a 2012. It was my mom's for quite a while. It's been in constant use since it was purchased and it's holding up. It's pretty incredible. In conclusion, I just found this eight-year-old iPhone to be a much better distraction-free phone environment for me than this light phone, and I am going to be putting it on eBay. It will be sold before I post this because I don't want to hurt my sale. Thank you for watching.